Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. Just a few points of logistics uh, before we get started. Today's presentation is being recorded, so you can look for an email shortly after this presentation and you'll find a link to the on-demand recording. Please do share this with others in your organization or maybe even consider using this as a lunch and learn. Due to the short nature of our webinar, we will not be fielding questions, but I'm sure today's presenter would be more than happy to have you contact him with uh, questions that you may have. Today's webinar is a lead up to an exciting AME event taking place in San Antonio, Texas, May 9th and 10th. I'm sure our presenter will share a little bit more about that as we get further into the presentation. But for now, let me go ahead and introduce our presenter, Glenn Marshall. I've known Glenn for many years, and he's been a good friend and partner with Lean Frontiers, uh, not only personally, but also as a, as a representative of AME. Glenn is currently serving on the Association for Manufacturing Excellence management team uh, in order to help lead a manufacturing renaissance. So for now, Glenn, I'm going to go ahead and let you take it away from here. Well, thanks, Dwayne, and uh, welcome, everybody. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to, uh, out of your busy day, to uh, consider what you and your company can do in closing the growing skills gap. What we've found at AME and also companies that I work with at uh, Texas Instruments and most recently Newport News Shipbuilding, that we have a significant shortage of career-ready citizens that have the skills, the work ethic, and all the things I'm sure you guys are challenged with. But what we wanted to share today with you is uh, what it's going to take for us to close that skills gap and also look and see what we can do to help young people find jobs, work, or careers that are best suited for them that will allow them to achieve the American dream and also help manufacturers and communities become more self-sufficient with people that are capable of earning a good wage and helping mentor the next generation of uh, manufacturing workers. So what I wanted to do is show, uh, show you some data about how bad the current situation is, but more importantly, we want to look at finding solutions so we could work together with you, your community, or your educators and help graduate on-time career and college-ready uh, citizens. Uh, I want to go back in history a little bit. If you recall, during World War II, there was a critical skill shortage and that we had to reach into homes, farms, and other places to recruit non-traditional workers that had never worked in manufacturing or the factories. And at that time, uh, the, the country was faced with how do you train this many workers to become skilled? And training with industry, which is a uh, one of the subjects that uh, Lean Frontiers does an excellent job of covering, uh, helped take women, farmers, people who had not traditionally been in the factory and taught them how to work and be successful. And so a lot of the stuff that we think of being kind of uh, the old way of doing things, the job instructions, uh, job methods, all those issues are tools that we're going to need in the future. And when you look at this uh, picture and you see, well, there was Rosie the Riveter up front and what she did, and they did it. And then you look to the next generation. And here you see a young person and a robot kind of embracing each other. And you say, geez, is that robot going to take all the jobs that we want our young people to have? But in fact, what we're finding out is that we need to have the same job instructions that we had during World War II to be able to write the programming and give instructions to robots so they can collectively do those low end repeatable jobs that we want we don't want to do. And what we then want to do are have these young people move up to the next ladder of their careers so they can be uh, engineers, programmers, coders, do that next level of work and leave the uh, repetitive, uh, somewhat uh, low-skilled jobs to the robots. 
So uh, that's kind of where we're going, and training with industry, we'll talk about it a little bit more as we go through here. I wanted to give you a little insight into what the uh, industry is looking at. And what we're finding is that 84% of manufacturers agree there's a talent shortage. And these numbers go up, go down. But in the end, uh, manufacturers, businesses cannot find the kind of people they need to fill these good paying jobs that are now available. And then when you look a little deeper, it says, well, how bad is that affecting businesses? And what we're finding out is six out of 10 positions go unfilled because of the skills gap. So when you look at the data recently and they say 7.6 million jobs were open, and that's more than the unemployment numbers, it's easy to say, well, geez, there's jobs, there's good jobs, but these folks don't have the skills. And then if you just look into manufacturing, where I come from, uh, by 2020, uh, it's estimated that 2.4 million manufacturing jobs will be unfilled due to the talent shortage. So what's causing all this shortage and disruption in the talent pipeline? And when you look at this graphic we have there, it kind of tells a story that I didn't think much about till after I talked to some educators and different people that said, you know, if we don't start educating young people at an early age to use uh, math, science, reading, all the basic skills we take for granted, by the time they get into high school and college, uh, they're probably not prepared. And when you look at the more Inter information and you say, geez, well, what, what's happening? And when you look that only 37% of 12th graders are proficient at reading, 25% in math, and 22% in science. So after you look at what's coming out of the talent pipeline in our high school, we are having more than 50% of the kids that are coming out really aren't qualified to handle most jobs, and it just says that they're going to be limited in what they can achieve during their lifetime. But yet, we're hearing everybody and their brothers saying, oh, you need to go to college. If you don't go to college, you won't be successful. But as you go and you look at the additional information you find is everyone's being told to go to college but only 35% of the jobs require a bachelor's degree. So it says all these young kids are being told, go get a college degree, but when the opportunity for them to get a college degree that's going to let them achieve the kind of financial rewards they want is going to be very limited. But the real disturbing fact, if you're a mother or father that has spent a lot of money getting your child through college and only 41 per, and there's 41 percent of recent college graduates were underemployed so when you think we spent all this money so they can go work in Starbucks and Starbucks in different places that maybe we need to reassess what we want and the good news is what we're finding out is now businesses educators communities are starting to say well geez you know why haven't we gone and looked at apprenticeship, work-based learning, um, other workplace educations that are what we need, and now we're finding out the employers are now getting to go with, to the schools and saying, hey, this is what we really need, and we're finding out that more and more uh, communities and businesses are getting together to start looking again at what it takes to be successful in a skilled position. And then we say, well, geez, if that's the case, what is it that would let us educate these young folks who their career in college ready? And I've been studying this now for several years, and what I found out is that 93% of the kids that go to CT&E classes graduate, and that's 10% higher than average. And what I found is, when I was going into schools like that I had been mentoring kids with, 
You go into these classes, the kids are up, they're active, they're moving around, they're working in teams, they're doing projects together. And I was really amazed at what the career and technical education curriculums are doing. And the other thing was, I saw how engaged these students were. And the other fact that was really interesting is they all seemed to stay after school, worked on projects, robotics, and different stuff. So it was really exciting to see this is something that excites them. And the other good news is we have some excellent teachers who are CTME teachers who support that type of education and, and really love it. And then when you say, well, everybody was supposed to go to college, and if they weren't in the advanced placement, they aren't going to make it. But yet, when you look, 78% of the CTME kids enroll in secondary education full time. So it says, if I was smart, why wouldn't I want my kids to take CTE courses, which will let them find out the careers they really want? And also, after they graduate from high school, and most of them have second jobs or internships or other things, then they're going on for post secondary education. And then the other exciting part is. When you look at the data these days, 27% of people with associate's degree or less are out earning people with bachelor's degree. So you say, gee, four-year education, big debt, and yet if I just send them to a trade school or a community college, they can learn the skills they need, and they'll out earn those students who have a bachelor's degree. And then when you look at saying, well, are these CTNE kids being steered into jobs and opportunities that they really uh, would excel at? Well, business, 33% of them, communication, design, computer, and information science. So when you look at what you want your young people to be looking at, the CTNE is, is definitely graduating or putting them in the direction of looking at these kind of education opportunities. I uh, wanted to drop back a little bit and talk about Newport News Shipbuilding. I'm a uh, Career Pathways volunteer, but the shipyard has always believed that we have to uh, work in the communities and the schools to help promote manufacturing as a desired career. And a lot of people think that uh, building ships is just a dirty old nasty job. And, uh, there's no exciting parts to it, but what the kids are finding is they go into the workplace. We have internships for both them and teachers, so they can come in and they can see what it takes to work in shipbuilding. And shipbuilding is anywhere from being a lawyer, you could be a doctor, a nurse, a fireman, a uh, contracts person, a skills craftsman, logistics. So there's so many opportunities. It's amazing what these young people see. And the important part about these internships is the teachers are being educated on what they should be teaching this next generation of manufacturing and shipbuilders. Job shadowing is another thing we do. Come in and let them see what it is. Uh, work site opportunities to see all the exciting stuff we're doing, like virtual reality, um, all kinds of things we're doing with uh, robotics and all the other stuff. We also participate in speakers bureaus, and we have groups that come together down in that corner there where you see all those kids surrounded by a shipyard employee who is challenging them to do a program or different things together, which gets them exciting. And then we also work with the middle school partnership so we can help get them excited about learning about what it takes to be in manufacturing. And then club activities, we do the egg drop deal. Um, and it's amazing when we do things like this, that the competition it brings, but the teamwork and how the people are starting to apply math and physics and all the other stuff. But what we've been able to do in Career Pathways, and I would hope that the, the folks listening in today would consider doing this in their communities with their companies. Career Pathways expose the students to different uh, career development exercises. And more importantly, we integrate STEM skills, 
STEM skills needed for workplace application. So when you look at this whole program, we're getting people excited about being in manufacturing, but it's engineering and all the other associate uh, skill levels that you need. So it's not just getting your hands dirty in the factory, but now you're going to be uh, programming computers, machines, and robots. One of the other things that we found that uh, at AME and with different companies and, and the National Association of Manufacturers supports this outreach is we started Manufacturing Day. Six years ago, we started in, in Williamsburg, James City County, and you say, geez, there's not much manufacturing where I'm at. But when we looked around, we found that we had uh, Walmart Distribution Center, one of the biggest distribution centers in this uh, in Virginia and on the East Coast. And what the students found out is when they went in there, these folks are driving um, forklifts, programming different stuff, making more than the minimum wage by a lot, have an opportunity to go to college. And then we went over to Print Pack, where we saw people putting together these packages that you can put. Um, sauces and different things for the shelf life for like months. And then Ball Metal claimed the fame as they make beer cans and it happens to go over to Budweiser. And the kids could relate to, we were hoping Coke, but they also seemed to be interested in Budweiser at the time. And then last but not least, we took, them, we took people to Newport News Shipbuilding where we take them through the shops and uh, one of our superintendents there, Mr. Perry, was talking to teachers and uh, guidance counselors talking about what it takes to become a machinist at the shipyard. And becoming a, a machinist at the shipyard means you've got to do calculus, algebra, two, and trigonometry. So everybody was kind of amazed that there's a lot of money to be made in the local community, and that almost every one of these companies pro promotes tuition reimbursements, that gives people an opportunity to, to uh, get a good job, have benefits, and continue their education. But, and the next thing I wanted to uh, talk about was the uh, apprentice school. Um, here lately you hear the, uh, in D.C., it started uh, back in the Obama administration that we need to think about apprenticeships. And the good news about apprenticeships are that they pay good money, uh, you learn a, a trade, you become a leader, and when you graduate from the apprentice school, uh, you're making like $60,000, you're debt-free, and the good news is you're now on your path to becoming a future leader at the shipyard. Uh, if you look down there in the, uh, the left-hand corner, the apprentice, they end up going out into the uh, work areas, working with a master craftsman instructor, and they learn how to apply what they've learned in the uh, academic settings. And quite frankly, they're learning that this is why I need math, this is why I need geometry, uh, this is why I need calculus. So they get to understand the stuff they're taking in the classroom really has benefit in their career and how to apply it so it makes them want to learn more. And then at the end of their four-year apprenticeship, uh, they go through a graduation process in which they uh, receive a diploma. Their credentials are able to be transferred to any school in the United States. We recruit nationally. The acceptance rate at the shipyard is, for the apprentice school is much tougher than Harvard because we have 230 slots approximately every year, and we um, have like 6,000 applicants. And when you say 6,000 people want to get in the shipyard, and only 230, 230 get accepted, it's really a job that's sought after. In fact, it used to be when everybody would say, "I, if you don't go get your education, you're going to go to the shipyard. Now everybody says, go to the shipyard, get an education and have a career. So uh, a lot of benefits. This is one of the key programs that's going across the country. This was started in 1919 and quite frankly is a best practice, a gold standard we support and more and more companies are going to it.
as you can see, my fat finger cut the best of me there. And the other interesting thing is when you look about this growing skills gap and how many people we need to uh, fill these opportunities, the next generation of shipbuilders and manufacturers and makers, we are now looking to women, just like we did during World War II, to fill the gaps. And when you look at this pool of potential people, it's pretty outstanding in the fact that 47% of the U.S. labor force are women and only 29% of them are manufacturing. But when you look at their education levels and, and all the uh, credentials they've earned, so more than half our associate bachelor's and master's degree, and then the other interesting part is women are holding more than half the U.S. managerial and professional positions. So it says women are the potential leaders of most companies. And in fact, in my job at Texas Instruments, I had uh, more women managers and supervisors than men, and they were put in positions like running logistics and machine shop and jobs. People say, "Well, she can't do that." And I said, yes, she can. She can manage a family. She can dog share, dog share, dog on shore, uh, work with the uh, workers and men. And then the thing that I'm most proud of, Jennifer Boykin is now the uh, first uh, president of the shipyard. And she has been very active in the Association for Manufacturing Excellence. Um, she's been to uh, Lean Frontiers activities, PWI. So all that stuff that she was learning and going to these conferences and these summits, uh, she learned through uh, AME and Lean Frontiers, and is one of the reasons she has been promoted to be the first uh, woman president at Newport News Shipbuilding. And when you start thinking of the future and how exciting it's going to be, and everybody thinks that the robots are going to take over the world, and uh, there's nothing left for people to do. Well, the good news is with virtual and augmented reality, we are now able to design for manufacturing. And, and one of the as exciting things we do is when a, an admiral comes through and he wants to look at his ship, we're going in and we say, well, admiral, what do you think about that? Well, I want this change and I want that color. And we can do it right before his eyes. So he's getting excited that, geez, this is really neat stuff. Uh, the kids also love it. But more importantly, now we are building aircraft carriers and submarines uh, using uh, augmented and virtual reality because it allows us to be more efficient, um, train people and reduce times, reduce errors, and improve safety. So all this new technology is really exciting and people want to go move into it. Now, I want to focus on the main purpose I wanted to talk to you all today is uh, we are holding a uh, Next Generation of Makers Summit in San Antonio. And the reason we're doing this is we wanted to bring together some of the brightest minds in the country who have experienced what it's going to take to close the uh, skills gap. And so what we've done is we have gone out and contacted industry and educational leaders who are going to be in San Antonio to share with us and our attendees what it's going to take to grow this next generation of makers. We're lucky to have Goodyear Innovation Center coming. They won the AME Excellence Award. And if you ever go to the NASCAR races or Indy 500, this is where the uh, hires for those race cars are made. And uh, these are handmade, but the interesting part is these folks are going to tell you how they're bringing in people and integrating them into their manufacturing process. I think you've all heard of Toyota. Toyota is going to tell us how they're working with the schools to generate the next generation of uh, technicians and, and mechanics that can come work for them. So this is a natural transition from uh, high school to a good job and then continue their education um, at Toyota with, with, the associate, with the assistance of other colleges and universities. Newport News Shipbuilding, they're going to show everybody what they've been doing with their apprentice school. Oh, we have SME, uh, 
Tooling U, which is going to share the new tools and opportunities they have to help people learn how to compete in the 21st century to include uh, all the uh, programming, leadership, and all the other um, opportunities and learning is required to be successful in manufacturing. Uh, one of the groups that I'm most excited about being there is Jobs for the Future. I met these people up in uh, D.C. and they have been working with the Swiss Embassy to look to see what it would take to um, deploy apprenticeships across the country using the Swiss and German model, which is quite frankly a very good reason um, to come learn from them. And then last, we have the uh, Center for Operational Research and Development, which has uh, done some research with manufacturers and educators to find out what is it manufacturers need and businesses need, and what is it that you know, kind of courses the schools need to provide in career and technical education. So as you well can see, these Organizations are going to be there, but we also want to encourage other organizations to come and bring their best practices so that we can end up finding some best practices that we'd like to deploy across the country. And then in addition to that, rather than spending all day listening to a death by PowerPoint, we're going to also provide a tour of the world-class uh, training facility at Alamo Academy in St. Phillips College. I have been to this operation. It's amazing what they do. They have manufacturing cells with like Haas CNC equipment. Uh, the students are there like on a scholarship that's provided by the or by the uh, companies in the community to let them get an idea of what the manufacturers offer, but what these schools can provide so these folks can get a career, learn about a career they want to be part of. And this way, the partnership between the community college, the uh, high school, and business is doing some tremendous things in the San Antonio area. Uh, we have partnered at, for this event with the uh, Association for Manufacturing Excellence and San Antonio Manufacturers Association. And the reason for this is we wanted to be able to demonstrate a community that has come together to look at what it's going to take to graduate career-ready citizens. And uh, this is a summation of what we're looking at, and we definitely would like to see everybody come um, to this event. It's uh, May 9th and 10th. It's in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and what we're doing is we're going to feature Toyota, Goodyear, Newport News, Alamo Academies, but we'd like to have other companies who want to participate and bring and share their best practices so we can have a big knowledge of what's really working and how we can deploy it across the country. Um, if you look down here at the bottom, you can join us and register uh, WWAME org event San Antonio 2019. And the other good news is uh, we want to offer a 20% discount using a discount code SAMNA. So for you or your educators uh, to come and join us at an affordable price. And the other thing that we are doing along with this uh, summit is we're going to have a uh, trade show and conference that's run by SAMNA. Uh, SAMNA, quite frankly, has reached across uh, South Central Texas and now has a big following that used to be just in San Antonio. Now it's taking care of the heart of Texas, and it's a, a great show. I've been there before, over 100-plus booths. Uh, we're going to have two keynote speakers. Uh, it's in partnership with AME. It's the San Antonio Summit. It'll be held the 9th and 10th prior to the uh, AME Summit, and the uh, conference itself is free. Um, I'm going to wrap up here, but I can't thank uh, thank you, Lean Frontiers and Dwayne, for putting this together. And we'd like to definitely ensure that anybody interested in learning more about the, what it's going to take to close the skills gap, you can contact me. You see my information there. And we would definitely want to share your information and knowledge with others. And once again, I can't thank you for listening. 
thank you to Wayne and let's get together and help make America make made in America and the American dream a reality for all. Thanks again. Hey, th thanks a lot, Gwen. Uh, not not only for doing this this webinar here, but thanks for your leadership in this important area. I really appreciate your many contributions over the years. You've you've got this. <laughs> I think you know this, Glenn. You've got this innate ability to connect people and organizations to hopefully accomplish bigger things, and certainly something you're tackling here. So greatly appreciate that. Uh, as as mentioned earlier, you you're going to receive an email from me shortly. Uh, with a link to this recording, uh, please do share that with others who, uh, within your organization and even outside of your organization, who might find interest in this information. And I do hope to meet you in San Antonio, Texas at the AME event. Uh, you will receive an email with a link to that event as well. So Glenn, thanks again, and thanks to everyone who participated in today's session. Have a great day.